this is fantastic and it's a fantastic day. We want Kansas to be known not only as the wheat state and the air capital of the world, but also the renewable state, where renewable fuels come out of this state and power this country and power the world. And we're well on our way to doing it. New technology is difficult to get to the marketplace. Barriers to entry are high. Competition, which we all believe makes us better, is stiff. But I appreciate and I applaud the efforts here to bring this new process to market. I've supported the ethanol industry for years. It now supplies hundreds of jobs in the state of Kansas in 15 different plants and local markets for $3 corn and milo, uh, which we like having the local markets to drive that price up a little bit. The distillers drive grains from these plants, feed our dairy and beef cattle. The cattle and ethanol businesses work well off of each other and with each other. In some cases, even we have the carbon dioxide harvested off of our ethanol plants and used to recharge the oil fields nearby. These are the sorts of complementary industries that we as a state of Kansas thrive on, building each step forward. And now we've added another step in the process, and that's taking the cellulose and making it into ethanol and making it into energy. Another step on a complementary system of integration of building a future for the country that is less harmful in the environment and more helpful for us to be energy independent and supply energy around the world. We as agriculture in Kansas are in the energy and conservation business. And we love it. Thanks for being here today. God bless you all. Let me try to uh, use just a few minutes to, to put this project in a much larger perspective uh, as to how uh, we, how the President, uh, this administration, the Department of Energy, uh, uh, really is approaching our energy, our energy future. The, uh, it is very strongly based, the President's words, an all of the above energy approach in the service of three major objectives. One is, as we've already heard here, growing the economy, creating good jobs. Second, advancing our energy security interests, not only for the United States alone, but for our allies and friends. And if we look at the situation in Ukraine today, you understand what I mean in terms of energy security uh, of our allies and friends being important for our national security. And third, uh, moving towards uh, the low carbon economy uh, that we need to address climate change, risk mitigation, and perhaps unfortunately, adaptation uh, to some of the uh, uh, harbingers that we are seeing uh, from global warming. Secondly, uh, I want to say that uh, in addition to all the above energy, and I'll come back to that, meaning that we really are looking to develop all of our, all of our resources. We also uh, work all along the innovation chain. And what we're seeing today is part of that uh, because uh, uh, you may see you know, one of these jars in particular, I can assure you, is the result of a lot of research and innovation. Uh, and, uh, but then we also, uh, if we're going to kickstart this, uh, we have to work with the private sector, with state and local governments, with our research institutions, universities, and laboratories, uh, work together to get these technologies deployed and drive those costs down uh, to be competitive. So this plant shows all of these features. Uh, the economy, clearly, uh, as we've heard, uh, developing this biofuels industry, uh, building these plants, that makes stuff uh, uh, is really about providing uh, really good jobs uh, in fact going forward. Uh, in fact, uh, I would observe that in the country, in no small measure connected to the revolution that we have seen in our energy production, in particular uh, the oil and gas, uh, oil and natural gas uh, revolution, that's been a major part of really a renaissance in, in, in manufacturing in this country. Uh, in the last four years, uh, 700,000 manufacturing jobs. And I want to emphasize those manufacturing jobs uh, 
be it for fuel or for uh, some electronics or whatever, those have the best spillover effects into the rest of the economy. For one thing, two-thirds of all of the private sector R&D in this country is associated with the manufacturing sector. And again, we see that really here uh, in the sense that this is not just about putting steel in the ground, it was about also uh, developing uh, an innovative conversion process uh, to take the cellulose into, into biofuels. Energy security, that second goal, obviously. Even as we produce more oil in this country, we should not lose sight of the fact that we still do import 7.5 million barrels a day of, of crude oil. We've made tremendous progress in lowering our imports, lowering our imbalance of payments, but we still import a lot of oil. And for those reasons, and for our environmental reasons, we never lose sight of the need to reduce our oil dependence. And there are three major pathways. Efficient vehicles, electrified vehicles, and alternative fuels. So this cellulosic biofuels push is part and parcel, again, of economy, energy security, and environmental goals. But we are seeing here today in Ugaton really the beginning uh, of, uh, of a new industry that is going to, going to address uh, all of these of these key goals. The other thing I mentioned was working all along the innovation chain. Basic research, development, demonstration, deployment. Uh, and here again, I'm going to ask actually about my two colleagues here just to stand up so you can see a face. They can stand up. So Dave Danielson here uh, on my right, your left. Uh, heads our Office of Energy Efficiency and Renewable Energy. Uh, they work uh, at, on research and development, uh, and that office uh, made an initial initial grant uh, for uh, what we are seeing here today. And Peter Davidson, on my left, your right, heads our loan office. So that's on the deployment end, getting act, getting things like this, like this, uh, this plant, uh, this plant built. So uh, thank you, gentlemen. Uh, As I say, we work uh, all along that, that innovation chain. So today, uh, and on the deployment end, uh, we, we, we are seeing how, a, uh, in this case, a, 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 the loan office uh, could really help uh, Avon go. By the way, as Manuel said, a partner not only in this project, but also in, in solar projects. Uh, maybe we'll see more. I should, I should say that the, the loan program has committed roughly $30 billion in an all of the above energy way. Fossil energy projects that lower emissions, nuclear projects helping to build the first next generation nuclear plants uh, down, down in Georgia, so-called generation three plus. Renewables, like what we are seeing today, and solar plants as well, uh, and efficiency projects. So across, across the board, the program, let me say, not only here in Yucatan, but across the board, has been a tremendous success. I mentioned $30 billion deployed, a 2% default rate, that's pretty enviable uh, in, any, uh, in any portfolio, uh, including your, uh, your retirement plan. Uh, the, uh, uh, and it's doing what it's set out to do. So for example, if I take photovoltaic, solar photovoltaics at large scale, 100 megawatt and, and beyond plants, the loan program kickstarted the first uh, of those plants. Now there are 17 additional projects, either operating or under construction, with purely private sector financing. So that's what it means to be kickstarting this, and we are hopeful that this is what we are seeing now is the front end of exactly that story in terms of cellulosic biofuels. We get a few going, 
and then the private sector will take off. Thank you, Secretary. <laughs> so, uh, we'll be celebrating the opening of one of our nation's very first uh, commercial scale second generation biofuels plant. You can say Kansans are used to setting the standard for energy production, whether it be regarding conventional or renewable energy. And I speak for both myself and Governor Brownback for saying that we take pride in our past work when we were in the Senate to help pass both the 2005-2007 energy bills in addition to the letters of support that we both uh, signed and supported uh, and with outreach to the Department of Energy at that time to help put into motion the economic and the regulatory tools necessary to make this plant's opening a reality. So today we are celebrating much more than the creation of a permanent high paying jobs in this community and all of Southwest Kansas. This plant will also serve as a new revenue source for Kansas farmers looking to sell crop residue like stalks and leaves and stems that are unsuitable to be converted into co-products like livestock feed. We already grow the crops to feed a hungry uh, world and it just makes sense that our state would be at the forefront helping to fuel a growing world with those same, with those same commodities. And from a national perspective, ladies and gentlemen, this plant will continue to move our nation towards a greater energy independence and weaken the grip of OPEC and other uh, oil cartels, uh, some from countries that really do not have our best interests in mind. So again, I want to thank Evan Goa for your investment and trust in Hubertin, Kansas. Kansas is a bootstrap state. You won't meet any harder working people. I want to tell everybody who is here for the first time from out of state that this is very typical of the weather that we have all year round. <laughs> Average temperature about 75 degrees. I'll tell you that it's 110 in the summer and 10 below in the winter. Thank you. I look forward to working with you in the future and fighting on your behalf. I might want to mention again that I look forward to working with you all in the future. And uh, <laughs> to create a common sense regulatory environment so we can uh, uh, proceed to even greater things in the future. That will allow having go in our rural Kansas uh, jobs to thrive and to certainly grow. It is a privilege to be here. Thank you very much.